Why don't animals have a problem if they don't brush their teeth, but we do? Have we been brushing our teeth for nothing our whole lives? You guys are already tuned into this Iberay Answers. You know that this question is very good, so it will be left for the end of the video and the answer is very cool. Let's move on to another sensational question from Luis Favarato, a longtime member of the World Manual, as indicated by the seal from his cell. How do trains make turns given that the axles are fixed? This question is so cool that I built a train track and train wheels here for us to understand. It's not as simple as putting the train on the track and adding a curve. It won't just work. I printed a small wheel similar to the trains but not identical. The reason will become clear soon. I'm going to put it on the track that we built with the laser. And let's see how this little wheel makes the turns, okay? The track has many curves and a slight downhill slope, allowing the wheel to roll on its own. Let's observe what happens. The wheel simply can't make any turns, it stops, it locks up. You can see here that when things are a bit straighter, it goes... When it gets to the curve, the tendency of these wheels is to go straight and then it hits the curve. I don't know if you knew, but when a car turns, the wheel that is on the inside of the turn travels less than the wheel that is on the outside. Because look, in a curve, the wheel that is here is traveling a much shorter path than the wheel that is here. But if we were to look at the car's wheels at this moment, we would have the front wheels turned, but the train doesn't do that with the front wheel. How do we solve this? The solution is to change the shape of the wheel. The train uses a conical wheel, which means that the inside of the wheel is larger than the outside. I made a very exaggerated conical wheel here for us to put on the rail and see if it can go down. Seems a bit crazy, right? But I'm gonna let it go, and if it goes down nicely, I think it's worth that thumbs up on the video already, huh? Especially because it's not every video where people explain building a train track, wheel on a 3D printer and everything else. Sh shall we go? What's really crazy about seeing this happen is that the wheel turns by itself. There's no steering wheel. How is it possible in this case with the train that the inner wheel travels a shorter path than the outer wheel? This is possible precisely because of the cone. It's as if the cone had wheels of different sizes. A big wheel here on the larger part of the cone and wheels getting smaller as it gets closer to the tip. On this curve here, for example, the inside of the curve, the tighter part, will have the smaller wheel on top with the tip of the cone. While the outside of the curve gets the larger part, Watch again and see how this happens kind of automatically. The wheel does this independently, but you might ask, Darny Barry, trains don't have wheels like this. It doesn't have two cones looking like two Christmas trees, like this thing you made there. The cone shape on train wheels is subtle and nearly imperceptible. In this image of an old wheel, you have to look closely to see that the inner part is slightly larger than the outer part. There's also a small protection on the inside to prevent derailment. But one very important thing for us to take into account is that the curves the train makes are much wider than this one. The train doesn't make tight turns, sharp turns, the train doesn't do a handbrake turn and that's why this wheel that I showed at the beginning, despite being very similar, it's not identical to the train wheel because it doesn't have this angle, this inclination in the shape of a cone that it would have if it were a train wheel. Question about our Octobot which we are doing with Petrobras and the federal government. Why didn't you put in a much stronger and much easier motorcycle engine? Look Antonio, I'm going to tell you that we thought a lot about the motorcycle engine, but after thinking a lot, really a lot, we came to the conclusion that it was not stronger or easier. Let's first consider the engine's strength measured by torque. Torque, in short, is how many kilos the engine can lift if we attach a lever here on the engine shaft and put a weight here on the lever, okay? A 150cc motorcycle, the most common type used for delivery and other purposes, can lift 3 pounds at the tip. So the engine is here, here we can hang a point 4 kilogallas and the engine can rotate. A little electric motor like the ones we used in the robot can lift 2.5 kiwi. It's much stronger than the motorcycle engine. Considering we have 4 of those motors, it would be roughly equivalent to 7 150cc motorcycles. It's much stronger than the motorcycle. 
In other words, electric motors can be much smaller than combustion engines. And that's what happens in the case of the motorcycle. And it's not that simple to put a motorcycle engine. Think with me. In the submarine, we used one engine on each side because to make a turn, you just turn on or accelerate this engine and it turns this way. To make a turn to the other side, you accelerate this engine and it turns that way. You have a steering control just by turning the engine on and off. In our robot, it's the same thing. We have two sets of legs, the right and the left. To make a turn, we need the motor that is on the outside of the turn to walk a little more, accelerate a little more. This relates to the topic we discussed earlier regarding the car training. So I necessarily need to have at least two motors or use a clutch in the middle, but it wouldn't work. The ideal is to use two motors. Imagine me putting two motorcycle engines. I would need two accelerators, two clutches, two gear shifts, two of everything at the same time. It's nearly impossible to synchronize and control something like this. Ultimately, I believe what occurred is this movement we see from Theo Janssen. The robot's design is inefficient. It can't move smoothly like a wheel, causing the engine to work at maximum capacity. The structure is overly robust, likely due to the submarine mindset where everything had to be strong and sturdy. Weight is not an issue for submarines, but it is for the spider robot since its legs constantly move up and down. They have to be light for the engine to handle and we exaggerated the weight. So the solution we're looking for now is to reduce weight and not change the engines. So in the next video, if everything goes well, you'll see how we managed to take many pounds off that robot to make it walk. But I'm recording this video at a time when we couldn't take off that many pounds. Don't miss the next episode. We're going to build a giant spider robot. Now things have really gotten beautiful. Because the new generations tend to be more fragile so that the previous generation ridicules them. It's true. We tend to call the newer generation now Nutella, Snowflake. But are they really weaker? Maybe yes, but physically. Here's why. As we evolve technologically, we become increasingly comfortable. We build things to make life easier. So if the younger generation always gets an easier life, it means they need to put in less effort to do things. For example, for my daughters, Helena and Melissa, who are nine and five years old, the car doesn't have gears anymore. Practically, there are no more cars with gears. In 10 years, when they go for their licenses, driving schools likely won't have manual transmissions. When I got my license, cars lacked airbags, but had electronic fuel injection. My father probably got his license in a big Beetle, which is a much harder, robust, uncomfortable, weaker car. When my grandfather turned 18, cars weren't even manufactured in Brazil. So looking at it from this perspective, the previous generation always had to go through a lot of hardships that the current generation doesn't have to go through. But there's a problem. It's that we who are older tend to look at the younger person and compare them to what we are now. So I look at my daughters and I don't remember when I was nine or five years old. Comparing my younger self to who I am now at 42 is unfair as everyone was once a child and a teenager. Did a lot of things wrong, did a lot of nonsense, and when we see the younger generation doing that, thinks that, no, in my time it wasn't like this, that in my time it was different, and there are also some comparisons that are out of context. Many people complain that young adults, even those in their 30s, still live with their parents instead of moving out on their own. Then the grandpa will say no, because in my time, when I was 20, I was already financing my own house. Yeah, but when I was 20, the house cost 10 times less than it does today, so this comparison is not valid. In summary, we get older, more annoying, have a little bit of envy of the younger generations and tend to compare a young person with an older person who had time to learn more. Ultimately, every generation finds ways to overcome life's challenges. Movie Rain serves a storytelling purpose. Is it because it's in the script or sometimes is it because it's raining on the same day? Look, in the good movies that are successful, practically everything that happens, everything, everything, everything was thought out and controlled. If a person passes behind the actor when he's on the street, that person is a hired extra whose clothes were chosen for him to pass exactly at that moment and the same thing happens with the rain. Because real rain, it's practically impossible to go out filming in it, okay? You'll get the equipment wet, there's no lodging and there's a crowd of people around. The rain stops, returns, then the sun emerges before darkness falls. Anyway, all the weather things, if it's too sunny, if it's too rainy, you try to control as much as possible artificially. One of the most famous movies of all time is called Singing in the Rain. 
It's a musical that in the middle of the musical has a scene where Jim Kelly, who is a famous dancer and such, he dances with an umbrella spinning around poles and everything else. You must have seen a photo of this scene somewhere. This rain is totally artificial. He recorded with a fever at the time because he was sick. There are some legends that say they even mixed milk in the water for the drops to appear better in the video. Recording actual rain is challenging as the drops are not visible. Some claim the milk story is false. But they had to put a very strong light behind the water drops that were being thrown there by some hose or something like that. And that's true. To be able to see a raindrop, you need to illuminate it very well. So, answering your question, rain appears in the film only when it's in the script and it's artificial rain. There will be some crazy person from experimental cinema saying that they filmed in the rain in a station that they wanted it to look like reality, but generally it's fake. Why do beached whales explode after a while? Oh, but I love these questions. The worst part is that they do explode. So much so that Wikipedia has an article just about whale explosions. What happens is that when the whale dies, it starts to decompose and this generates gases inside the whale and it starts to swell. Normally these gases are slowly released, but it can happen that the whale's thick skin with a lot of fat does not let it escape and the whale turns into a bladder that keeps inflating. And you know what people like to do when they see something inflated about to explode, right? Yes, most whale explosion accidents are caused by people who poke the whale that's about to explode and as you might have imagined, when a whale explodes, the sight is not very pretty because the whale's guts all come out on the person who went there to poke the whale. But I couldn't go through a whale explosion without telling one of the most sensational stories I've ever seen in my life, the rotten whale rain. It happened in the United States in the state of Oregon in 1970. A sperm whale beached itself. The sperm whale weighed 8 tons. It beached itself and began to rot. There was this horrible smell and people wanted to get rid of that huge carcass. But no one saw a way to remove such a large creature from the beach. Until someone had a wonderful idea. Let's put a dynamite there and blow up this whale. Pieces of it will fly everywhere and then the birds will eat it and everything will be fine. The problem with humanity is that sometimes someone has a harebrained idea and other people go along with it. And that's exactly what they did. They put half a ton of dynamite right in the middle, right under the sperm whale. Then several people went to watch the whale explosion. They stayed at a safe distance a few hundred meters away. And when the bomb exploded, it's not me saying this, I'm going to read a report from a reporter who was there covering the whale explosion at the time. Suddenly, there was this 30 meter high geyser of blood, fat and sand shooting up into the sky. It was like a snowstorm of fat with tiny particles of fat floating down after the large chunks. The few dozen spectators and reporters who had come to watch the explosion from what they thought was a safe distance about 400 meters away began to scream and run. But how do you escape from a stinky rain of fat? The detail is that it wasn't just rotten fat that was falling. Giant pieces of whale meat began to descend from the sky and fall everywhere. Fortunately, no one was hurt. What's worse, the whale didn't completely explode. There was a big piece left there. If an astronaut kills another on the space station, is it a crime without gravity? There are two issues here. We've already covered this in a manual do mundo video. There is indeed gravity on the space station. Practically the same as on Earth, but they don't feel gravity because they're in orbit. To change it up a bit, I have to get the globe in eBay answers, otherwise the video isn't worth it, right? They are spinning wildly around planet Earth about 15, 16 times a day, okay? An absurd speed. It's as if they were falling, but they don't fall because the speed they are at tends to project the ship out of the planet. But they don't go out either because gravity is pulling. So gravity pulls down. Their trajectory tends to take them out and they keep spinning eternally around the Earth. The physical experience is similar to being in a free-falling elevator. At the moment the elevator falls, you float. We've performed this experiment at the World Manual in Mawa. It involves a clash with gravity but without the sensation of gravity. What happens if an astronaut kills another in space? Who judges the crime that occurred in space? Inside a ship from a specific country, such as Russia, the laws of that country apply even when the ship is sailing in international waters. It's relatively simple. Most astronauts we know go to the International Space Station, 
which is not owned by a single country but a consortium of several different nations. There are several astronauts of different nationalities. Each module of the station came from a different country. The agreement there is that if an astronaut commits a crime, he will be judged by his nationality's country. If a Russian kills an American, the Russian will likely be tried in Russia, which may not result in a fair outcome. Fortunately, it has never happened. However, there was a recent accusation of a crime committed in space. There's an astronaut named Annie McLean, and in 2019, her ex-wife accused the astronaut of accessing their joint bank account from the International Space Station without authorization. This demonstrates the possibility of an astronaut committing a crime against someone on Earth. In the end, this accusation led to nothing because the astronaut said she was only accessing the bank to see if there was money to pay the bills at home and everything was fine. If this trouble can occur inside the International Space Station, imagine what will happen when we colonize Mars. So, because of this, there is an area in law that tends to grow a lot, which is called space law. Pretty crazy, right? How do you know if your books are still selling from the first to the current one? Juan World Manual has more than 20 books and they're all selling, okay? 50 Experiments to Do at Home, released in 2014, remains a bestseller even after a decade. Links to all our books are in the video description. You can also search for World Manual Books on Google to find them. But let's go to the dog's mouth, right? After all, if the animal doesn't brush its teeth, doesn't floss, doesn't use mouthwash, doesn't go to the dentist, how does it not have cavities? Yeah, actually it does have cavities. A study from 98 that I found here took 435 dogs and analyzed their mouths. 5% of the dogs had cavities. So, dogs and other animals do get cavities, just much less than humans. Just to give you an idea, half of the children and teenagers in the United States in another study have cavities. And how can this be, right? If we take care of our teeth practically three times a day, you brush your teeth, how do you get cavities and your dog doesn't? It's so hard for this to appear in his mouth. The problem is what we eat. We eat a lot of sugar. And the bacteria that attack our teeth love sugar. So we create a real colony of bacteria, a breeding ground for bacteria eating sugar. And we also drink acidic beverages that attack our teeth. And sometimes we drink acidic beverages with sugar, which is the case with soda. Animals don't eat sweets and don't drink soda. And there's another thing. Animals tend to eat fibrous hard things which help to clean their teeth. And we could also eat these fibrous and hard things like apples, carrots, which help to clean the teeth. But if you look at an apple and a brigadero, I don't even need to say which of the two you're going to choose, right? A very interesting thing that proves everything I said is that there are some studies that show that our ancestors, people who lived thousands of years before us, had cavities, but like dogs, much less than us. Because they had little access to sugar. The little sugar they could eat directly like this came from honey. The rest only in fruit and things that are much less sugary than a candy or a condensed milk pudding. Guys, I made a list of references that I used to build this video, okay? In the video description, you'll find a list of topics covered in this Manual do Mundo video, along with links and books. Creating this list is time-consuming, so it may not always be possible, but it's great for you to see the sources of the information. If you disagree with something, please check the sources before discussing it.